So during worship this morning, um, the Lord asked me if I wanted him to throw a ringer in the middle of my message. And um, I told him I don't like to speak anyway. And then he likes to do this to me. I think he likes to torture me. But um, I'm going to start off with kind of recapping. We're talking about the God series, and we're really just talking about who Father God is in the beginning. And we're going to move on to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, too. But right now, we're, we've been kind of focusing on who God is. And over the last couple of weeks, we really were talking about how our perceptions of him can be flawed and how it changes, like, we perceive him to be like this, and when, you know, and he's supposed to show up like this in our box. And when he doesn't show up in our box like we think he should, then we go, well, you must not be good, or you must not be faithful, or, you know, you must not be trustworthy. And so we've been talking a lot about what that looks like and how to, ex- and how to go back to the Lord and find his goodness in the middle of our circumstances and to look for his perspective instead of always looking from our own. And, um, and so I'm going to really cover today, you know, just the idea of God testing us. What does that look like? And, you know, and how, like, how is he good if he's also testing us? Like, what is that, like, how is that comparable? And, um, so to start off this, I felt like the Lord gave me a couple of stories. Um, when Sean and I were in high school, we met and he was Mr. Popular, you know, like, he's wild and crazy like he is now, and, you know, constantly, like, constantly making jokes, and, you know, and just, um, we met actually in band, and, um, and we, he was constantly, like, the center of attention, always, and it was one of those things where he, he then begins, and I'm terribly shy, you guys know this, like, terribly shy, and he starts winking at me, (laughs) and I'm like, popular guy who's older than me winking at me, he's probably just doing this to pick at me, you know, and, and so over, like, an entire semester, was it more, I don't, I don't know, it was at least a semester, he's, he's winking at me, and then one of, one of my friends came up to me, and he was like, hey, Sean likes you, and he's like, but he has a girlfriend, and you, this whole story, you know, like, (laughs) I, you know, (laughs) that's a whole other story that I'm not going to talk about, but, but so over like an entire semester, you know, I'm, I'm watching him and I'm watching his character and, you know, and he's, he's wild and crazy. And, but my good friend who's, who was friends with both of us, he, he was like, Misty, he loves the Lord. He was like, he, he's, you know, he really does love the Lord. And there, and he was kind of just talking to me about where he was at. And we started, we met at my friend's house one time and, and I got to hear Sean's heart for the Lord. And I was, I told my sister afterwards, like, well, we could be friends, but you know, he's, not at all like, you know, I'm interested in. And so, um, and so then over time he asks me out on a date and I didn't have anything better to do. And I kind of, I kind of liked him. I don't mean that, like, I just mean, I wasn't dating anybody, first of all. And I guess he had broken up with her too. Her name was Misty, by the way. And, um, (laughs) and so we go out on our first date and we go see what you said, Dr. Doolittle. Was that what it was? And, um, and we, we get there early, and we're walking around the theater and um, kind of waiting for the movie to start. And I am, like, barely talking to him, like, because I'm so shy. I'm terrified of him. I still have it in my head that he's, like, just teasing me so he can go make fun of me later. I don't know why, but that's, that was what I was convinced of. And so he's walking, we're walking around, and, and he starts to kind of share with me. He was like, you know, I've, I have dated other girls, and I, and I dated other girls before I knew the Lord. And there, you know, there might be people who come up and tell you how I treat women. And he was like, and how I treat these girls. He was like, and I want you to just, he's like, I'm asking that you would come to me and ask me for truth. You know, he's like, I want you to, to come to me and to say, you know, this is what I've heard. Would you speak into this? You know, and, and I was, he was my first real boyfriend. And so, you know, I was very, very naive and very, very trust, like trusting. I, I was like, sure, why not? And um, like, that sounds, that sounds reasonable. I would want you to come and ask me questions if you heard rumors about me, you know? And so we, we began the, the process of dating. And what that looks like is really the process of dating should be one where we're looking at each other's character and we're, we're watching and we're learning and we're getting to know each other, seeing if we're a good fit, but also seeing how they respond in circumstances. You know, like we're, we're getting to know them, not, not in a way that's like, I'm judging everything that you do to see if we're going to fit. But instead, it's a way that says, I'm looking for connection with you. I'm looking to find ways that we connect, ways that we, that we, just, like, we just fit together. And I'm also looking for 
red flags. I'm looking to see, like, how are you going to respond to the situation? How are you going to respond under pressure? You know, what are you going to do when somebody comes up and they say, hey, did you know that Sean, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, he's watching that for me, and I'm watching the same thing for him. How are you going to respond? You know, at some point in our relationship, we both had different people pursuing us. Sean had gone to college a, a year ahead of me, and, um, and we both had opportunities to date other people. You know, people came up and they were pursuing our hearts, you know, even though they knew that we were in a relationship. And we had the, we had the opportunity to sit and to, like, dialogue. We were dialoguing over, like, instant message that was so slow on dial-up that it was painful. And, you know, so it was like we had to dial up and hope that the other person was going to get on, and then we would talk, you know, typing messages back and forth. You couldn't see each other or anything. But, but what we found was that during those seasons, we were able to really, like, trust grew deep because he was away. I couldn't see him. And, you know, and then I had, we, we were able to talk on a deep level, on a heart level, where sometimes face-to-face my anxiety would hit and I wouldn't know how to share what I wanted to share. You know, and, and I think that's kind of the point I'm wanting to get to today of, like, when we're looking at Father God, you know, we're looking at a connection with us. He wants a connection with us. And, you know, and he's working to build a relationship with us that's based on mutual trust and mutual connection, you know, and so it's like a dating relationship where we're getting to know somebody, you know, and, and so when we look at things like God's testing us, well, in a dating relationship, we don't use that term, but that's kind of what we're doing. We're testing them. We're not throwing them under the bus and like, like here, we're going to set up a nasty scenario and watch you watch what happens, but we are saying the world happens and life happens and scenarios happen that aren't necessarily great, you know, and we're able to observe their character in the middle of those scenarios, you know, and, um, and that's, that's what Father God does for us. He's not creating scenarios for us to fall into a trap. He's literally saying this, like, he's watching our life and he's going, you know, how are you going to respond to this? How are you going to listen to me? What are you going to do when these things happen? You know, so that's the part that I, I have to now fit this into my message. So they were with me. All right, we're going to start off in Deuteronomy 8.2. There is a parallel in the New Testament that I, um, that I came across, and I really felt like the Lord just highlighted it and began to kind of just, he built it out, and there was so many different directions I could go with it. So um, we're going to start off with reading in Deuteronomy 2, or 8, 2 through 3. It says, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. So honestly, I read that scripture verse, and I'm a like 97, 98% mercy high on the, like the gift testings for mercy. Sean has the other 3%. And, <laughs> and so, so when I read this kind of a scripture verse, I'm like, well, that's not very nice. That doesn't sound very nice. You know, God's testing me and he's humbling me. Like that, that sounds like torture. You know, like that doesn't sound very nice. And when we put this in the context of God putting, putting, sending them out into the wilderness from Egypt to go to the promised land. We also know that God didn't send them on a direct path. He didn't send them on the shortest route to the promised land. He literally led them on the longest route ever and it ended up taking like 40 years. They actually looped around multiple times because they kept not listening. And um, and so I read this and I, I read words like, he humbled you and he tested you and you know he made you hungry. He, or he, I should say he didn't make you hungry. He let you be hungry. You know, and I kind of go, it doesn't, doesn't sound very good God-like, you know, like that's, like if I was a good father, am I going to let my kids get hungry, you know? The, the answer is yes, sometimes I do. When they refuse to eat their food, I don't let them just junk out on other food. I actually let them get hungry, so they're going to eat the healthy food in the end, you know, so there is that idea. But as a kid, I don't like that idea. I don't like the perspective that I read here. And, and I think that what we do is we take the different words and we, we apply misconception to them, like misperception to them. We, we apply our problems to them and we kind of go, well, you're, you're, you're testing me. 
I don't like to be tested. I'm a bad tester. Like if I'm in school, I'm one of those people who gets anxious and I can't think and so I can't answer the questions right because my brain freezes and I, you know, like testing's mean, you know? And, and yet when we look at it in, in the context of a dating relationship, you know, I'm not dating somebody. Like I'm not, I wasn't testing Sean to see him fail. I was observing him and I was watching him, but I was really, it was really establishing trust, you know, and what happens is when we become, um, let me see, I knew it was falling off, I'm sorry guys, hang on, it fell off. I was told that this is the worst type of shirt you can ever wear with, with one of these clip-ons, so next time I will be more prepared. But, but when, we, when we're dating, you're not, you're not looking to test somebody. You're, you're literally observing them, and you're really wanting to grow in, in a deep place of trust. And places of like, deep trust are born, in, like, to say it like this, in the trenches. You know, like when horrible things begin to happen in your life because life happens, you know, deep trust be begins established in our personal relationships by watching the character of the other person and, and watching the way they respond, you know. And so God allows deep things and hard things to happen in our lives because he's building something in us. He's, he's wanting to establish a relationship that's deep. It's not just surfacey. And so when we look at the Israelites, they're coming out of, I think I was reading, 400 years of slavery. That's a long time to ingrain in a mindset how to act and how you should be responding. So then, so then God does some crazy miracles, and they run out of Egypt, you know, and Pharaoh and his army die, and now they're on the other side. And now they're like, wow, Jesus is amazing. God's amazing. You know, and they're rejoicing, and then they go on their journey, and they're heading to the promised land. What they don't know is in the process of, of the wilderness, God was looking to create depth of a relationship in them. He was wanting to create deep trust. But what he had to do was begin to shift the way that they thought. They thought like orphans because they had been praying for God to save them for 400 years. And now God came and he saved them. And now they, they look at it and they're like, yay, he did that and he's taking us to the promised land. So that means that I'm going to be, like, every, he's going to now show up for everything. And, and so what they were saying was they became entitled. It was like God showed up and he did all of this, you know, and now I can just step into the promised land. Now I can literally just, like, everything, God's just going to do everything for me. And God was going, no, I'm taking you into the promised land because, or into the wilderness because I want to develop a mutual relationship with you. I do my side, but I also need you to do yours. Like, I, I'm going to ask you, like, here are, here are the laws. Here are the things I need you to do. And when you do these things, I'm going to show up and I'm going to be really big and I'm going to do these things. But they were offended because, you know, so, so they're in the desert. That's hot. If you've ever been in the desert, it's warm. There's not water everywhere you want to look. You can't just drink water. So they were in the desert because God sent them there. And they became hungry and they became thirsty and they became whiners. You know, what was in them was coming out, and they were, instead of going, God put us in the wilderness, so he's going to supply for us, and even though I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, God has us here for a purpose, and he's going to do something amazing with it. Instead, they were like, you brought us out here to die. Like, every five seconds, when you're reading through that, that story, like, every five seconds, you're literally reading, you brought us out into the wilderness to die. You're trying to kill us. We should just go back to Egypt. It was better there. We should just go back and tell them we're sorry, and please put us back in as slaves. You know, that was their response to the Lord, because they didn't have, they weren't sons and daughters of the Lord. They were orphans in their mind. And so their mindset was, oh, great, God did all these great big things. Well, at least we think it was God, and now we're out here, and he's not feeding us. So he obviously has called us out here to die. You know, wow, he's really good. You know, like that, that response was going on in their heart back and forth. You know, it was ping-ponging, and they were having a hard time to being able to go, yeah, you're, you did this amazing thing, but, but now we're hungry. Like, if you can't feed us, then we can't see these amazing things. And so when they would ask him for food, or they would go and they would demand for Moses to bring them food. God always supplied. He always did something. You know, and what, when we read this, if we read this in context, he says, I let you be hungry, and I fed you with manna which you did not know. 
nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone. But what he was saying was, it says he, he brought us out there to humble you. What he was doing was he was bringing them out there so they could become completely dependent upon God. So he stripped away everything that they knew, not because he was mean, but because it was of the orphan mindset. It was of, enslave, in, of slavery. And he brought them into a place of freedom, but they didn't comprehend freedom. So they were still trying, they were trying to live in freedom from a, mind, a bondage mindset. And so they were literally going, well, you're humble. Like, like you literally, we don't even know how to cook this way anymore. Like, there's no food to cook. And then you're bringing heaven, like, food from heaven. Nobody has ever seen that. How do we cook this? And God was like, yeah, become dependent on me. Let me teach you. Let me, let me instruct you. You know, and, and so I don't kill on this. Like, we, the whole entire passage of their 40 years was a journey of them going, we don't know what we're going to do. We're freaking out. And then God shows up and does something amazing. But what he was actually asking them to do was to go, ask me. You know, like Moses was really, really good at this. And Joshua was absolutely amazing at it. They literally went to the Lord and they were like, what's your plan? These people are going to come against us and we know that we're going to have to fight them because they don't, they're not happy that we're going somewhere and we're crossing through their, their land. What do we do? And God said, well, this is, how you ask, this is how you need to respond. And when the Israelites listened and obeyed, they always won. They won every single battle. You know, like, it wasn't easy. That There was always a partnership that was required. You know, Moses had to lift his arms up for hours. Like, they literally sat him on a rock, and then they had people holding him. I mean, you've had, like, even during worship, you're like, okay, now my arms are tired. You know, like, we get about five seconds in, and we're like, okay, I think that it's enough. You know, hours, he sat there and held his hand. He, it was a required partnership between God and man. And throughout the entire scripture, there's a required partnership between God and man. And it's not because God's lazy, and it's not because he's, he's not competent or able to be able to do the things that he was supposed to be doing. It's because he desires deep connection with us. We can't have deep connection with him if he does everything and we sit back and watch. Does that make sense? Like, I, you know, Sean and I have a great relationship because we have communication, we talk, we do things together. You know, like that's one of the biggest things is that we actually, like, we enjoy hanging out together and spending time together, and we do things together. I show up and he shows up. That's what makes our marriage work, you know? And if one of us is showing up and the other one's not, that's not a relationship. You know, a relationship takes partnership. So, yeah, let me see where I'm at here. So comparing, so I want to parallel two different scriptures. I told you in the beginning that, that this is actually found in the New Testament. It's found in... Matthew, I'm going to read Matthew 3.16 all the way through chapter 4, verse 1, which is only a few, chapter, a few verses. But there's a, there's a chapter break in the middle, but we all know that chapter breaks didn't actually happen in the Bible. So, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the scripture verse that is coming out of Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. So that's where he ties, he parallels the two wilderness experiences, and he's bringing us into to an opportunity to investigate what the parallels are. So, so this parallel between the two, so going back to the word test in Deuteronomy, I'm going to kind of jump back and forth just for a minute. The word test, I have, a, I have a slide up here for that. It says, it's a, it's a root, and it means to make a test, to pr- proved, put to the test, or to be tempted. Um, It's the process of melting gold and silver for refinement, and it's to prove the truth or genuineness of anything by something fixed, or I'm sorry, by some fixed principle or standard. So you're you're watching something, and you're 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 seeing like you're looking for refinement in the gold and silver process. You know, it's it's a process of refinement. But one of the really cool things about the word test, there's a whole lot of different. Every single time you pull that word up. In the dictionary, it actually talks about, um, about precious metals first. That's the first response to it. And the precious metals, one of the definitions of the word test actually means 
there's, um, when you're looking for copper within, within a mix of different metals, you can put in another chemical. So like for copper, you can put in ammonia. And if you drop in ammonia, it will turn all of the copper a light blue. It will make it appear out of all the other metals. It will appear a different color. So really God's, like, to say it like this, God's digging, like he's looking for gold in us. He's, he's looking to find the precious metals in us by, by putting, thing, putting us into, like he's letting us be in situations. He's letting life happen. And as circumstances comes up, he's watching, he's dropping in, to say it like this, he's dropping in ammonia and he's watching. He's like, where's, where's the precious metals? Where's, where's, the, where's goodness in you? Where are you going to listen? Like where, you know, he's, re, he's sifting us. He's looking for the precious metals in us. He's not torturing us, you know, which is what we like to think of tests. We don't, our culture doesn't like tests, but he's not testing us, like looking for our failure. He's going, where's the beauty? Like he's refining us, you know, and sometimes like gold and silver has to have heat to refine them. We don't always have to have heat. We can just have life. We, we get refined by different things. All, you know, like all the different, I believe the different metals get refined by different things, you know. And, and so with that refinement, he's looking for, he's looking for the small, tiny flakes of, of righteousness. He's looking for, can I trust you in this? Can I trust you in this? You know, he's not, he's not going, are you failing? I'm watching to see you fail. I'm waiting to see you fail. He's literally going, I'm looking for your beauty. I'm looking for you to show up in this area. You know, I'm looking for you to go, you know, yeah, God, I'm scared to death to get up on stage and to preach, but I'm, I'm going to do it. You know, like he's looking for that. And, and so the moments we choose to step out, he's like, yeah, I can trust this one. You know, and, and that's what's, it's really, it's really neat. So moving from the word testing, I'm going to skip over to the next scripture verse. Matthew 3, 16 and 17, the reason why this is so important is at the very end, God says, out of the heavens, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The word well pleased, it means to think well of or to approve. But when you look deeper into that word, it actually means the word approbate, which I'll, I'll just read. It differs from approve, denoting not only the act of the mind, but an expression of the act. And if you pull all that down to the root word, the word probo, it means to test, to try, to prove, or to demonstrate. So what this was saying in the scripture was throughout Jesus' life, up until the point where he gets baptized, before his ministry ever even started, he had been tested and found approved, and tested and found approved, and tested and found approved, over and over and over again. So the time he gets to, to be baptized by the Lord, or by, by John, and the Lord comes out and he says, I'm well pleased with him, he's saying he has passed everything I've ever thrown at him. He has passed and I have found deep levels of trust in him. And so now I'm launching him into the ministry. And the launching of the ministry was launching him into the wilderness for 40 days. So he had already passed his tests. And then the next verse says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. So he had already passed tests. And then he was tested some more. But he was, that was happening because of Jesus' need to show, like he needed to be able to pull in the truth. He needed to be able to, there was a connection that had to happen between the wilderness experience and Jesus' experience. Because in the wilderness, they were not required, they weren't supposed to be out there for 40 years. If we you know, if you read through the scripture, it should have been like an, a year-long transition. And it was only because he, God wanted to set them apart, show them who he was, and show them how to depend on him. And then move them into the promised land where they could, they could receive their inheritance. They were out there for 40 years because they didn't want to learn the lessons. You know? And so, so there's, there was the, the difference between the Israelites not wanting to learn the lessons and Jesus who had already, you know, the, let me find my scripture verses here. In Luke 2, it says, I, um, I'm not sure if I... In Luke 2, it talks about how Jesus was, was he was r being raised in stature, like, and, and in favor with God and man, you know, and the word stature means that he was not only get, becoming tall and strong, he was also, it was also, it's a character trait. So you were, you literally watch the Bible talk about the fact that Jesus was growing in wisdom and in, and in stature, and it means that he was growing in his, 
he was physically growing, but he was also becoming somebody that people could depend on, somebody who was trustworthy. The, the word stature doesn't just mean physical. It's also, it also is relating to your, your emotions. So God, Jesus was already showing that, and then he was sent out into the wilderness to be, to be tested some more by the enemy. You know, and, and that was because we needed to see the parallel of someone who could, of a, of a group of people who failed for, for 40 years. They had successes in there. There, were, there wasn't a complete failure. There were successes in there. But then, then Jesus, who didn't fail at all. So the orphan mindset versus sonship. You know, and so the orphan mindset was, we're walking along in the desert. It's really, really hot. And it's, you know, we haven't had food for days. And so now we're like, God's got us out here to die. We're going to die. Everything's, you know, everything's coming against us. It's hot, and we're going to die. And then there was Jesus who was sent out here to fast for 40 days. And the crazy scripture is, it says the word then. He then became hungry. I don't know how you then become hungry after 40 days, except for the fact that it must have hit really, really hard, and he was, like, famished. So then the enemy comes to him at that moment. He waits until... His 40 days of, uh, are over, so the 40 days are complete, then the enemy comes. Now Jesus is really, really hungry. And he comes in and he says, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. This, this scripture is really, it's really talking about, he's saying, you have a rightful place in the kingdom of God. And you have the right to make bread. You, you literally, like, this is your right. It's within your inheritance. You can command this, and it will happen, and you can eat. And Jesus' response to him, in contrast to the Israelites, was, I refuse to eat until God says I can. They're going, you brought us out here to kill us. We're all going to die. We're starving to death. Why have you done this? You, you tell us you want to get us to the promised land, but we're going to die here because you're not feeding us. And Jesus says, if I die, I die, but God's brought me here for a purpose, so I know he's not going to let me die. I won't eat until God tells me to eat. I refuse to step into my own authority and to create something out of nothing because I can. But I am relying 100% on God. I will be 100% dependent on God. Do you see the difference? You know, one of them is, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm entitled to food, and I don't trust that God's actually going to get me there, even though he's done some crazy cool things in my, like, parting the Red Sea, and I crossed on dry land. Like, that's something I would love to see, you know? But, but we've seen all these crazy miracles, but we don't trust that you to feed us. And here God is going, you know, Jesus is sitting there going, you know, you have me here for a purpose, and you've sent me out into the desert for a purpose, and I will not create my own situation to make sure that I'm safe. I will let the Lord create my situations for me, and I will let him tell me what to do. In John 5, it says, Therefore Jesus, Jesus was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of God can do nothing of himself unless it is something that he sees the Father, ha- and the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also I'm sorry, the son does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all the things that he himself is doing. The father had the ability to show him everything he was doing because there was a deep level of trust that had been birthed out of a relationship that was going back and forth. It wasn't God down to Jesus as his minion telling him to do stuff. There was a give and take in the relationship that was happening here, where where God was saying to Jesus, I'm showing you what I'm doing, and I can trust you to do only what I want you to do. You know, and and that's the challenge that we have, you know, because we, a lot of times we live over here with an orphan mindset that says, I don't, I have to demand for you to show up. I have to sit there and beg for you to come and and to help me, and and I don't trust that you're going to actually do what you've promised, because because I don't, I, I, I know that I've had miracles in my past. I know that you've done certain things in my past. I know that you've set me free from all these different things. But are you really going to show up in this situation? I don't know. You know, and so, like, maybe you've brought me out here to die. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe I'm just going to die. Like, maybe that's where you're ha- you have me. Maybe that's your, you know, because that's an orphan mindset. God's called us to be sons and daughters. Jesus died on the cross so that we would be inheriting, like, we would have the inheritance of him, of Jesus. You know, and when we move from an orphan mindset over into, into a son mindset, so we go, 
you know what? You brought me out here, and I'm really, really hungry, and I'm really, really thirsty, and in the natural, I'm probably not going to make it too much longer, but you've brought me out here, and I'm not going to leave it until you tell me where to go. Like, I'm not going to leave until you bring me food. I'm, you supply it. I'm not going to create my own situations, because we all do that. Like, we love to do that. We're like, you know, this is what God's told me I need to do, and I'm not seeing it work out. It's Abraham creating an Ishmael. You know, it's him going, I'm running out of time here. I'm getting a little bit old. You've promised me a son, so maybe I just need to work harder. And so he works harder, and he creates Ishmael, and that's the problem because he wasn't trusting in God to fulfill his commands. He wasn't trusting in God to actually be good to his word. I'm completely off where I was supposed to be, but that's okay. So, a couple things to, to kind of wrap this up. They wanted God, the Israelites wanted God to show up and to do everything for them. They didn't want partnership with God. They wanted a God who made their life easy. They wanted him to always be the miracle maker. I need this, poof. I have my own little genie. And every time I have a need, poof, he fixes it. You know, and Jesus says, I'm not going to let you cross into the promised land unless, unless the priests pick up the Ark of the Covenant and step into flooded waters and stand there. And then everybody has to cross over. But there were certain restrictions that they had to do for God to show up. And the entire Old Testament... We see, we see the kings who choose to listen to God and how he shows up in different ways. Every single battle was won in a different way because they, he was teaching them dependence on them. He was going, for Jericho, I want you to do it like this. I want you to win your battle this way. But for this battle, I want you just to worship. Just worship. Just send your worshipers out. I'll route them. But you have to do something. So in Jericho, they had to walk for seven days getting you know, all kinds of comments and ridicules, and they were silent for seven days walking around Jericho, you know, and that was God's strategy for that moment. But then they had to stay dependent on God because they couldn't use Jericho's strategy for the next battle. They had to go back to the Lord and go, what's next? How do you want me to go up, up against this next place? Where do you want me to go? How do you want me to, to, to do this? And then he had a completely different strategy for the next, for the next battle. You know, and so he was teaching them, you have to stay fully dependent on me. You can't begin to think that you know everything. Our culture in America is one of independence. We are very, very proud of our independence. You know, we want to be a separate, and we want to be completely, like, we want our kids to, to grow up, you know, and to become independent children who can think on their own, who can hopefully think with our values and our 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 ideas, but to, but to be able to function on their own and not call us for every single thing. And there's beauty in that. I definitely want my kids to move out of the house and to not be living with me when they're 40. Because I don't want them to be, but there's a healthy dependence that, that the, the kingdom of God's upside down, it's an upside down kingdom. What we want for our children, God wants the opposite for us as children. You know, because we're not independent adults separated from him, we are dependent sons and daughters who need to go to him and need to say, what do I do now? Daddy, what do I do about this? Daddy, what do I do about this? Okay, that sounds really weird. You want me to just go out and worship when a whole bunch of people are going to kill me? Okay, let's go out and worship. That sounds crazy. But God shows up when we do it. You know, but we have to tune our ears. We have to build a relationship with him. He has to be able to trust us, and we have to be able to trust him. And that means that life happens, and life is an opportunity for us to go, this is scary, and I don't know if you're going to show up, but I'm refusing to stay with an orphan mindset, and I'm going to choose to step into a son and a daughter mindset. I'm going to put on the mindset of, of you've called me here with purpose, for purpose, and you're not going to let me die because I have a purpose, because I've been called here. And so you're going to do something. You're going to change something in my situation, even though I feel like I'm completely surrounded. What's your plan? You've brought me here. What's your plan? I won't step out, and I won't create bread to eat. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to let you provide for me. Does that make sense? You know, and, and so the challenge, I think, for us today, I have a few things written down. I want to make sure I read them so I don't mess them up. How are we viewing our trials? 
Are we looking at the things that life throws at us from a perspective of an orphan mindset? Like, do we have to beg God to show up in our life because we don't really think he's going to? You know, or can we stand in a place of confidence with God and go, you know what, this looks really scary to me, and I have no idea what you're going to do. And if you don't remember, I'm actually like a brick maker, not a warrior. You know, like that's what the Israelites were. They were brick makers. They, they, they think they probably built the, I believe, the um, pyramids and stuff. Like they were part of that whole process, you know. They were not warriors, but God called them to be warriors, you know. And, and so we have to change the way that we think. We have to make sure that we're moving from an orphan mindset into, into a son, son and a daughter mindset. So the next question is, are we responding like Jesus to the invitation to go deeper in connection with God? Can we really trust him? Is he really good to us? And are we showing ourselves to be trustworthy? When he says, go pray for that person at Walmart, do we go, um, that sounds scary. Can you just send somebody else? Where's Pastor Sean? <laughs> I've asked that. Where's Sean? <laughs> I want Sean to go pray for him because he's bold and I'm not. But he's calling me. And if I, you know, there have been times where I'm like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So what do I do when I choose not to do it? I, I put on my orphan hat and stand over here and go, can you just send somebody else? Can't you? Like, I'll just bless them from afar. Jesus bless them. What do I do? You know, what, what the Bible says to do is we go before the Lord and we go, ah, gosh, I know that you told me to do that. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I let fear win this time. I'm not going to do it next time. Next time I'm going to step over and go, this sounds a little bit weird, but can I pray for you? Sorry I'm one of those weirdos. You know, and if you don't want me to pray for you, that's fine. But I felt like God wanted me to. I, wanted, I felt like God wanted me to reach out and to say, hey, you look like you're hurting today. Can I help you? So we mess up. We repent. And then we change the way that we act. And we become trustworthy. That's what children do. They make mistakes. Hopefully they come back and they repent. And then, and then they begin to change their ways. You know, if we just go, no, I'm not going to do it, God. And I, and I never repent, and, I never, and I'm like, well, maybe next time. He doesn't send as many next times because he's finding us not trustworthy. And so the next times go to somebody else. Because all of a sudden we, can, we begin to build a lifestyle of no. And the Lord's like, well, if I can't hear a yes from you, then I'm going to find somebody who will say yes. There's a scripture that says he's, his eyes are roaming to and fro looking for who, you know, somebody who can be found strong. You know, God wants us to be found strong, each one of us. And it's not for the, like Sean said before, it's not for the superheroes. It's for all of us to become superheroes. It's literally for us to go, you tell me to do this. It's terrifying that I'm going to choose to do it because you've called me to be courageous in the process. He's not looking to see us fail. He's looking for our good. He's looking for the gold in us. And he's pulling it out and he's going, this, this is what I'm looking for. This is beautiful. I don't care if it's a small bit. I can, I can work with a small bit. He's watching to find it. He's looking to find us successful in a test. And I'm going to close with this. When we, when, we take, when we take a driver's test, everybody here would probably say that the state asking us to do a test for drivers is a good thing. Because if we all have the same standard, then there should be a measure of trust on the road. Okay, if everything's working like it's supposed to, we turn on the blinkers like we're supposed to, we go around the roundabout the correct direction like we're supposed to. <laughs> you know, those things happen, you know, and, and there's a process of testing. There is the written test, and then there's a season where we learn, and, and then there's the driving test. That's, that goes back to the word, let me find it so I don't get it wrong. Re I think it's, is it reprobate? Is that the word? Approbate. It's approbate. It goes back to that word. That's the written word and the action being approved. That's the word that means well pleased. You know, so when, when we are taking a test, we take the written test for our driver's license, and then we go and we take the action test. 
and we have to be approved by both to be able to get our license. And then we have to go and show that to our parents, and then they have to begin to build trust deeper with us, you know? And that's how God works. When, you know, the, the, the idea of Jesus being sent into the garden to be, or into the wilderness to be tempted, it wasn't that his testing from the beginning of it until that point hadn't been enough. It was that he got his driver's license, and now he was stepping into ministry. And so now he had another level. He had to go deeper into trust with Father God so that he could continue to show himself approved because he was setting a standard for us, fully God choosing to set a standard that humans could walk in to become one with him in a way that we can do what he says. And every single time he whispers, hey, go over here and do this. We go, yes, sir, I'd be happy to. You know, and, and then trust is established. And then he begins to show us what he's doing. Does that make sense? All right, let me pray for you guys. Jesus, I just thank you for your relationship. God, that you desire, yeah, you desire connection with us. You desire a partnership. And God, you didn't just, you're not just a genie that you just go and do everything for us, Lord. You, you hold back until we choose to step into, into agreement with you. You choose, to, you, you choose to wait until we come up and we partner with you because you so desire relationship with us that you refuse to move without relationship. And so, God, like Moses, we just choose to say, if you don't go, we won't go. Yeah, just the response of Moses' heart back toward you in, in the wilderness was, God, if you don't go with me, I'm not going to go. I will not move from here if you don't go with me. And so, God, we just choose to say, God, we want to be dependent sons and daughters on you. We want, to be, we want to be fully dependent on every single thing that you say. And as you say it, God, we will choose to step up to the task of building trust with you so that we trust you fully and so that we can fully be trusted by you. Yeah, so that, so that we can change the world because we're just yes men to you. We're just choosing to say yes to you whenever you ask us to. Yeah. Yeah. Amen.